Welcome to Module 3.2, Getting Started with Microbe Trace. This presentation is part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Ellis Campbell, and I'm a computational biologist at the CDC. Now, this module is part of a collection of training materials and resources meant to help you begin analyzing SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences. Today, I'll be talking about microbe trace and its use with genomic data. If I go through an outline here, uh, we'll begin by covering and introducing microbe trace. Uh, we'll begin by looking at transmission networks um, and, and the different types of input files that you'll uh, be able to use, as well as diving into some genomic um, data in microbe trace. And then finally, a, a demo using simulated data and then an introduction to resources for you to continue your learning. So what is microbe trace? Well, it's a powerful and secure data visualization tool uh, to allow you to map transmission networks that exists solely in your web browser um, and does not communicate information over the web. Uh, this tool handles various types of data inputs encoding genomic and epidemiologic data. And it really stands as a user-friendly way to explore COVID-19 data. You can access the tool using a modern web browser like Google Chrome, uh, using the URL um, at the bottom of the page. Let's take a step back and cover transmission networks. What are they um, and, and how are they useful? Earlier in module 1.2, uh, we covered uh, phylogenetic um, distances uh, between SARS-CoV-2 sequences. And this is very useful information, but it falls short in one particular way. It, it is very difficult to integrate epidemiologic data with phylogenetic trees. Um, and so transmission networks are a way to render that uh, genetic data as a network so that we can readily integrate it with data commonly collected during contact tracing investigations. For example, person A has had some kind of contact with person B. That integrates very clearly with virus of person A is this distant from virus of person B. So by integrating these two data sets, it really allows a fine grain resolution of transmission dynamics in the face of an outbreak. So that we can design intervention efforts specific to that outbreak, as well as develop future prevention strategies for outbreaks down the road. Now, in COVID, oftentimes folks don't have um, a direct knowledge of who they may have come in contact with. And so microbe trace enables you to um, encode data that uh, indicates a person's place of work or a place of residence, wherever an exposure may have occurred, will allow you to visualize and map that on top of your genomic data. So the way that that is mapped is with what we call an edge list um, or a link list. An edge list is uh, a contact tracing list. It's really just person A's ID, person B's ID, and then the type of contact that that may be. One of those may not be a person. It may be, you know, person to place. Um, and if so, you may want to encode that information um, as an additional column here. You can see we have contact types indicating both contact tracing and person to per, uh, person to place links. So we'll cover an integrated example of what this might look like. Um, first, we'll layer on the people and the places. You can see the people represented as black dots here. And then if we layer on the places, we can also see that um, you know, they're represented as uh, squares. Okay, this is the node list information, um, you know, a, a list of characteristics in Excel to describe these individuals is perfectly sufficient. Now, when we layer on the edge list that we described a moment ago, we begin to see person to place links. Um, and you can see that, that not everyone is connected there may be um, disconnected dis, um, clusters or groups. Um, now we can layer on the genetic information and show how those disconnected groups might share similar genetic sequences here. These are the ge pairwise genetic distances. We can layer on more information. For example, here we've sized notes by uh, how large they or how connected they are um, to other individuals. We can take that a step farther and layer on other information um, describing 
um, how symptomatic or asymptomatic they are to get a better understanding of how this network um, comes together. So let's look at the different ways that we can import genomic data into microbe trace. Probably the most common and most frequent is an aligned sequence file in a FASTA format. On the left side, you'll see what that looks like. It really is just a simple text string where you have the sequence ID followed by the sequence. Now, these often come in an unaligned format. Um, and there is no difference between an aligned or an unaligned FASTA other than whether the sequences are aligned. We'll get into the importance of, of making sure that you have an aligned sequence in a moment. Um, we also accept distance matrices for the more advanced users out there that may have um, their own uh, analytic and, um, uh, approach to uh, devising genetic distance. You can collect your, your um, distance matrix and we will import that and render pairwise links. Um, and for those uh, more comfortable with phylogenetic trees, we accept the NUIC format. And what we'll do is take that tree and kind of crawl it to understand pairwise distances on that tree so that we can render it as a network. So we'll get into each one of these in more detail. The sequences often come in a raw sequence format in, in a FASTA file. And there needs to be some level of pre-processing um, and quality control to make sure that we're um, getting valuable comparison. Um, and we'll walk through a few of, of what those pre-processing steps might be. Once you have the aligned sequence file, you can import that right into Microbe Trace and we'll visualize it for you. So I'm gonna give you an idea of what a, a good quality sequence alignment looks like. You can see that while all of these sequences are actually identical, um, you know, they're comparable, everything is in line. But we commonly see, especially in, in the realm of SARS-CoV-2, um, areas of the genome assembly that are um, of poor quality. And that could be due to low sequencing coverage in that particular region where we can't quite make out whether it's an A, a T, or G, or a C. And so those are replaced with the letter N. Now, if you have long stretches of N, like we have here in this fifth row, um, you're going to need to um, remove those regions or um, in some cases, remove sequences altogether because they're really incomparable. Um, and so there needs to be some level of quality control over the amount of ins and, and how spread out they are across the, the genome assembly. Um, now, another common problem that we see is just misaligned sequences. You can see that there's kind of streaking or tearing across this, um, this genome for rows two and, and four. Um, and they've kind of been shifted to the side um, and, and that is, um, a, an example of a poor alignment quality. We would want to make sure that those are properly aligned either manually or with the program. Um, and, and those are the types of things that you want to look for as red flags in your analysis. So to really get down to the details of how we compare these genetic distances, in most cases at the sequence level, we're looking at um, actual pairwise distances once it's aligned. And when we see a difference in, in the DNA, um, or RNA, we will um, count that difference. And for example, the pairwise distance here is um, four SNPs. Um, and so moving on to the next type of, of data format that we uh, typically accept uh, are phylogenetic trees. And you can download these from a variety of tools on the web. Um, most commonly might be Nextrain, uh, which we covered in the last module. And um, then there are the aligned sequences um, allow, that allow you to build your own tree using any bioinformatic tool. So the, the important thing is we want to arrive at this NUIC file format for the tree that can be loaded right into microbe trace. Now, the, there, this is a very easy approach. You can download trees from very reliable tools like Nextrain. Again, you can build your own. Um, and, it, and Nextrain allows you to uh, download metadata along with your tree files. But we do want to caution you that some web-based tree building algorithms do not clean uh, ends from sequences, um, do not uh, necessarily check the alignment of the sequences that you're handing it, and they may lead, misleading, may lead to misleading results. So um, we want to make sure that you understand the tree building process um, and that it's done properly before you pass it into microbe trace. 
And in much of the same way, um, we can render um, networks based on distance matrices. Um, a common tool is the, the kind of the guts of NextStrain is Augur. Augur can um, export a, a pairwise um, genetic distance matrix. You can, of course, um, generate your own from raw sequences if you follow pre-processing steps and then calculate those distances according um, to whatever algorithm that, that is most um, valuable. But ultimately, we need to arrive at a distance matrix format that can then be imported into microbe trace. Um, and this can be both as SNPs, um, single nucleotide differences, or it can be as uh, in terms of percent divergence, so how, how distant two things are. Um, the key is that an increasing number leads to increased distance. I'm going to switch over to a demonstration of microbe trace using actual files. And as you see at the top, we have a node list that just describes um, the characteristics of individuals. For example, we've got uh, things like the facility ID, if they're in a um, skilled nursing facility, gender, and whether the, uh, the patient's vital status. And then we also have a NUIC tree. Um, again, these are simulated data, but um, this will give you an idea of what we're um, working with. So once we drag those two files on, we can hit launch. And our network will come into view. And initially, um, I kind of want to give you an introduction to what the tool looks like. So you notice that you're in a web browser. Um, but as soon as you jump in, you will see nodes positioned on screen. The nodes are positioned according to um, a physics simulation. The nodes push each other away. The lines that connect them pull them closer together. Now, in the top left, you'll see a variety of, of interaction points. First, you can freeze or pause the simulation by hitting the pin, the, the um, pin all nodes button. And then you can actually dig in and start to play around and, and look at particular individuals within the network. If you get lost because you're zoomed too far out, you can hit the concentric circles. The same applies for zooming too far in. Um, if you find an image that you're interested in keeping, you can hit the download button and uh, export it in a variety of formats, including scalable vector graphics. Um, but the, the real meat of the tool is this gear here, where we can visualize data associated with the network. So we can say add a label um, to the to these individuals. But no, notice they're very much overlapping here. You can't read it. We can go over to this network tab, access the physics settings, and start to spread um, the network out and change some of these characteristics. Uh, we can increase the length of these lines to get an idea of, of how many people are here. Um, but this is a very deeply connected cluster where almost everyone is connected to everyone. And we want to fragment that. And one of the ways that we can do that is identify a genetic distance threshold um, relevant to the particular pathogen of interest. Um, here, we'll, we're going to pick 1.2%. Uh, um, and it does begin to fragment the network. You can see this group of four fall off um, to the side, and, and this little node kind of pops out to the side as well. Microbe Trace offers this nearest neighbor algorithm, where it crawls the network and finds only the nearest neighbors for each person and keeps only that link. Now, when it finds equidistant links, it will keep all equidistant links, and that's why we have some of these interconnected clusters, but by applying this, this filter, we have now really narrowed this down um, to kind of four independent looking clusters. So what we can do, I'm gonna take off the labels here. We'll size nodes by how many neighbors they have. Um, so you can see the, the highly connected people um, from the earlier part of the network there will color nodes by um, what facility they came from. And this is really critical. So I can drag this up towards the top. And we can start to see um, that you know here we have one color, I pin all the nodes. 
this group, we can even put an ID label of the facility as well. So group C um, really has multiple different clusters. There's, there's two uh, distinct genetic clusters um, of COVID sequences in um, facility C. And so that means there's two independent introductions that actually spread to other people. Then we have a few introductions in community C that never spread. These are kind of different variants of the, of the virus that just didn't quite um, transmit to a partner. However, if we look at communities A or facilities A and B, they both share um, really a very similar virus that exists in, in both um, uh, places. That virus also transmitted to facilities uh, D, E, F, and G. And so this is a much more, um, you know, concerning pattern, um, whereas down here, this seems like th there might be some initial uh, points of introduction, but ultimately um, those can be um, slowed. Um, and, and you can see here that we don't have a lot of transmission. So this is um, kind of a high level use case of microbe trace to get an understanding of what your networks look like in the context of the genomic data. And before we close, I want to describe some additional views that microbe trace can provide um, and that are very helpful in analyzing epi and genomic data together. For example, if you have data in the format of zip codes, latitude and longitude, or state and county, we can integrate your network with the map and kind of overlay that on top of each other. If you have uh, timeline data, uh, you can show Gantt charts, as we've shown in the bottom left, to get an idea of duration and, and events along a period of time. Uh, we can also provide epi curves that aren't shown here, as well as histograms that allow you to um, very rapidly get an idea of an age distribution or something along those lines. And finally, we have a list of links and resources for the uh, URL to the tool is up here at the top. Um, then we have a, a very long tutorial video where we go through each view and show you how to, to work each particular setting. Um, and really everything you want to know is available on our GitHub page. There's sample data on um, our GitHub page, and there's also sample data um, uh, that we demonstrated with on the Epi uh, and Genomic Toolkit uh, that OAMD is providing for you. And if you ever need support, you can email microbetrace at cdc.gov, and that email goes directly to me and the rest of the microbetrace team. Um, I want to uh, go over some brief acknowledgments. This is a very small team with really one developer at any given time, um, and then a core team of people for uh, product development, testing, analytics, communication, but um, this is a very small team. Um, and then next, we're going to uh, cover the next module 3.3 of real-time phylogenetics with Usher. Um, and that's uh, a part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit. If you want to find further reading um, or subscribe, you can follow the link that's on the screen. Thank you.